Well, oh, we're okay. <laughs> now I'm going to do it. Sounds definitely. Well, there it is. I was just going to turn that down a little bit. All right, welcome everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you today the AI seminar speaker, um, Professor Majid Desoki, uh, who is the Dean's Professor and Chair in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at USC. His research area is transportation system optimization, where he has authored over 100 refereed publications. His paper, Optimal Slack Time for Schedule-Based Transit Operations, was awarded the Informs Transportation Science and Logistics Best Paper Award. He's a fellow of IISE and serves as associate director of METRANS, a center focused on solving important urban transportation problems. He received his PhD in industrial engineering from the University of California at Berkeley and MS and BS degrees from Purdue University. So today he will tell us about cost sharing transportation systems. So welcome, Manjit. Well, thank you, thank you, Satish. Uh, so I'm gonna just basically give a very high level talk and kind of give you kind of a sense of of the, we have, I'm not sure you're familiar with, but you, we have a big center in transportation at USC, Metrans, that's funded by the um, US DOT and cost shared by the state of California. This really work wasn't funded by, some of this work's been funded, that. this is funded by uh, most of the other agencies, but we carry it on through the Metrans Center, and it's it's definitely a center that that's well-funded, and faculty actually, each year we have one call RFP where we send out grants, well, not grants, but proposals for people to put up, up to, it's about $100,000 per faculty member that people uh, can compete to. And the success rate there is typically around, um, I would say 40%, so it's much, um, much, um, I'd say higher probability than NSF. But, but the work I'm gonna talk about today has been funded by numerous agencies, including the National Science Foundation and um, the, the USD projects. So I'm gonna talk about several projects, and the, the common theme here is cost-sharing transportation systems. So I actually, so one, I'm not sure how, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about transportation. One of the principles about transportation is volume is king. Volume is king, and, and it's cheaper, and of course, the more you get stuff in a, in a basket, whether it's people or goods, the better it is for everybody from a congestion. So, I mean, sure, we're capacity constrained, but not, I think we're more, more inefficient than we are capacity constrained. Clearly, if we use the capacity successfully, we could reduce the congestion um, uh, significantly. So, how can you improve efficiency without um, without increasing capacity. And that's kind of the idea I've, I've started recently under that kind of thing. So one way naturally is to get people to cooperate, right? So if you get people to cooperate, you need to figure out some way that they share the cost of that cooperation. And that's why I call it cost sharing transportation systems. So I'm gonna talk about two different particular applications. And, and these app, one is ride sharing, which is mobility basically for people. Another one is goods movement. And the second example is actually really shows you the kind of motivation behind the goods movement one. It shows you the kind of projects I like to get involved with and that have been very fruitful for me from an acquisition is that was a very applied project. It was you know, funded by the, uh, the California Flower Association. And in doing that project, I realized there was a lot of open research questions and we wrote an SF proposal and got funded. So I think a lot of people kind of work and start from basic research and they move into uh, applied. I sometimes work backwards where I do a lot of consulting or, or, or applied work and I realized that I don't have the skill set to solve that and then I go and, and write a, a proposal for it and get it funded. And I, I find that to be a very useful way of, of doing my research. Um, so I'll first start off with the ride sharing one project. And actually it started, in 2007. In 2007, I was in that cycle where I needed funding. Okay, so I got to, my area has basically been of always kind of application domain of transportation. There was a professor, Fernando Ordanas, who was very much heavy in optimization. And then there was Sven, <clears throat> some of you may know Sven Kohling, a professor of computer science in 
at USC, and he's an AI person. And so we, we were thinking, okay, is there a way we could put this three topics together and go for a grant? It turned out that the US Department of Transportation at that time has uh, this, this basically broad agency announcements where, where they had, the RFP was designed the transportation system. This is in 2007. Designed the transportation system of the future. And, and of course, one of us being a computer scientist and computer scientists loving uh, buzzwords in terms of acronyms, not buzzwords, but acronyms, we came up with uh, basically something called the transportation marketplace, which was basically saying treat every car like a taxi, pre-Uber. This is pre-Uber, pre-everything. -pre and we wrote the proposal and it got funded. And, and ever since then, ever since the 2007 until nine, and at that time when I, when I started, actually it was kind of funny because at that time when I started, when I explained my research to the average person, they'd say, oh God, you're really boring me. Can we just start? When I started describing in terms of the transportation marketplace, like literally everybody said, you need to commercialize this. You need to start you know, doing this. I said, I'm not really interested. And then of course, a couple of years later, we know what's, what's happened to the industry. So the interesting thing about this that 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 project is that the RFP was this was was to design the transportation system 50 years down the road. That was their their mission. What we didn't realize was within 10 years, uh, what we were proposing in a sense was but was is becoming a reality. So it's it's a much shorter time frame. But what you'll see is that the kind of system I'm talking about is quite different than an Uber or Lyft, and I'll kind of explain to you somewhat the differences between the two. So that's kind of a quick overview. So basically, the motivation behind the work is the congestion. There's a group actually in Texas AM that, that estimates the cost of congestion nationally. And you know I don't really care if they get it right, but if you could just think of the orders of magnitude, you know. $160 billion, even if they're half off. You know, I mean, we're talking real dollars in terms of what congestion costs to a society. And, and I, I really, at that time, and I still do believe, is, is we're not really, a, sure, we're capacity constrained, but we're not as much capacity constrained as we think because there's a lot of unused capacity. Just go on any freeway and you'll see how many people are in a car. Go on any kind of transit system and see how many idle seats are still there. You know, this isn't, yeah. And does that also include health? Problems like you know added pollution. In that estimate of cost, yes. So, it, it, uh, it, but the primary, the primary uh, contributor to that is that the time you spend commuting is time that you're not working. So it, it's the value of time. So it's, it's mostly the value of time uh, that comes into that. But clearly, with today's technology, we, you could do some things that you probably couldn't have done back in 2007. A lot of this stuff is pretty standard now. It's still not there yet, but it's it's, it's getting there certainly. So if you go back, the idea of ride sharing really isn't new. Some of us who are older remember the 70s very well, right? I mean, uh, hitchhiking was very popular back then, and uh, we used to get by. And most of the hitchhiking, I mean, or even just ride sharing, is it's pretty unorganized. Uh, it's usually families driving, getting together, and joining trips or, you know, neighbors doing it. But there's really one example. There's two examples, really, of very successful, spontaneous, ride sharing and it's called slugging and it occurs at two places it's san francisco it's, it's san francisco and dc this is the one is in dc and and the reason it works is because it's from the it's from the suburbs virginia suburbs where the people meet and this is the one coming home from washington dc and there's a spot a parking lot in the virginia suburbs where people pull in and, and then they just pick up two strangers and they go and the reason is because of the carpool lanes from the Virginia suburbs to downtown. And uh, it's cost, the time savings in that is about 25, 30%. So people are willing to, to pick up complete strangers. To, and actually, there's studies that show that this works pretty well because people would rather get in the car with a complete stranger with someone else, right? So power and numbers. So they're not gonna wanna enter to a complete stranger by themselves, but some other strangers with them, they feel, they feel that they have more empowerment. The one in San Francisco is actually in Berkeley. And it's to cross the Bay Bridge. And the reason there's an incentive there is there's a toll that you have to pay if you're not a carpool car, it's not a carpool number of people and then you qualify for the carpool lane. If you have enough people, you qualify and you get to waive the fee. The slight problem, of course, if you know San Francisco is going across the Bay Bridge from San Francisco to Berkeley, there is no toll. So there's no incentive really to do slugging on the way back home. So that most of those people take BART back home. 
So there has to be some kind of alternative or it's not going to work. So that's kind of the, I would say, the unorganized. But recently, we've seen this kind of notion of organized ride sharing. And I'm going to make a big distinction. Well, there's, in that world, there's the service operators and the matching agencies. The service operators are the drivers, and the matching agencies are the companies that do it. And there are really two types of companies. You're probably familiar with the companies that are what I call the revenue maximizers, the professional drivers. And, and there you have Uber, Lyft, and Didi. Those are the ones where the drivers. But there's other companies in there where what I call, what I fall in, in the cost sharing, where the driver, the only reason the driver is picking up passenger is to reduce their trip cost. And so the, what, were, what are ways you could reduce your trip cost? You know, when, we, when I started this in 2007, and you know, you know it's, not, it's not that ride sharing was a revolutionary idea in 2007, is that people at that time thought, um, maybe people are going to, because it has to be an economic incentive. And so you got what, what's an economic incentive? The cost of the trip has to be high. And if you go back to 2007, you got to remember the gas prices. And people were, were projecting gas prices to be close to $10 a gallon. And, and this part is going to definitely be true. That's still going to be true, is that freeways are going to probably, the 110 that you're familiar with maybe, that's the new model. That's the new normal. Uh, agencies, transportation agencies, historically have funded road construction through what's called a tax, the gas tax. The gas tax is going down, not because of the tax itself, is that people, car fuel efficiencies are, 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 are making the cars more efficient, so the revenue that they're generating from the gas tax is less. And they're clearly not going to increase the gas tax because, because uh, politically that's just not going to happen. So the agencies need to get money somehow. So they, what they create, of course, is these hot links, right, that you see on the 110, where basically uh, you either pay if you want to go on it or you have a carpool, okay? And, and because of that, if you, if you look at the peak time, and I've measured the peak times from the 110, from, uh, let's say, from the 405 where it partic and then where it dies in, let's say, you had USCs where the hot lane stops, that could be as high as $10, $12 a day, one way. So if you're looking at taking that lane, and if everything starts becoming a hot lane, you're looking at a cost of maybe $20, $20 just for that short portion. And on top of the gas parking fee, well, parking is also subsidized. One of the things that people don't realize, parking is probably one of the most subsidized uh, things that uh, zoning laws and everything make parking uh, much cheaper than what it really is. So if you think about paying the true cost of parking, the toll roads, and the gas prices, the cost of commuting can be as high as $30 in the future. And so at that point, you start thinking, okay, does it make sense for me to start sharing the rides? That was the model we had. Until it gets to that level, people aren't gonna do it. So because of that, there are some companies out there that what, instead of hiring a professional driver, what they do is they, they basically, the driver is doing it to share their cost. They're just doing it, they're, they're, they don't, they have an origin and destination. They're just not driving around trying to pick up people. They actually are just having, they're, they're just, they are just trying to, um, reduce their costs and pick up passengers to do that. And that's what we call cost sharing transportation. The driver is not trying to make money, they're trying to recoup their costs. Then the question is, how much should I charge my people who are ride sharing with me such that we could recoup the costs? Now, if you go back and look at Uber and Lyft and look up the strategically why we are today in, 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 um, in, in the state that we are in, and if you think about how Uber and Lyft marketed themselves initially, they were brilliant in some ways, very, very smart. They were first, now they're being called ride-hailing ride or e-hailing companies or TNCs. When they first came out, what did, what did the media call them? Ride-sharing companies, right? They were, they were sold as ride-sharing companies. And then they're, now, they're starting, now they're starting to move in that, but they certainly are. And why did they do that? The cities needed, needed to let them in. San Francisco and all these cities were against them, right? Because they had the taxi industry and the taxi industry generates revenue for the city because you have to get a license to get a bike taxi, you get a medallion or whatever, and you need to get these. Now, this is a whole industry that was gonna totally break that model, but they had to convince the city somehow. And what they can, can convince them in is the fact that we are the solution to congestion, right? We will solve the congestion problems. We're a ride sharing company. <clears throat> And that's what they sold themselves on. And they were very strategic about it. They, they sold them that, and they got users kind of addicted to cheap transportation, not really paying the true cost of the trip. And because of that, 
because of the of the of the I, I I believe the pressure from the citizens being addicted to the to the cheap transportation and the fact that they could justify it in and the notion that um, you're going to reduce congestion, I think cities started adopting. And now that it's become kind of accepted, it's going to be very hard to go back. But that was the marketing. And once they're in, they're in. So the question is now, we've had now four or five years of data. Have companies like Uber and Lyft reduced congestion? Have they, pro have they delivered on what they said they haven't? We have some empirical data, which I'm going to share with you. And then there's some models, which I've developed with some of my co-authors, which also kind of uh, substantiates the empirical data. So let's, 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 let's go that route first. So let's first try to ask ourselves, what's the impact on these companies, the TNCs, the Uber lifts on congestion, OK? We've had enough data, empirical data, to look at it. So there's some empirical studies that have showed that basically 60% of the users of these systems would have used either a public transportation agency or walked or taken a bike. So 60% of the people are moving from what's called a le something that does not have an impact on congestion to something that does, right? So that's 60% new users to the system that would not. The other 40%, okay, they are moving away from, let's say, driving or their own taxi. Okay, but at least 60%. So that's one th point of the data. And then 60% increase in workday traffic in, in, um, have, have been uh, due to basically the Uber and, and, and Lyft trips. So what, what's causing this? So you have, sh so one is the shift in demand, that you have more people actually using cars than before. But just as important is this notion of deadhead miles. What do professional drivers add? They add the concept of deadhead miles. If I want to go from, let's say, ISI to USC and I'm driving myself, I, that's, that's the distance. But if I'm calling Uber, the Uber driver has to come to ISI. That's the deadhead miles. Now, if there's an infinite number of Uber drivers, then you expect the deadhead miles to be zero. But we know also, behaviorally, the, the Uber drivers do not position themselves to minimize deadhead miles. They position themselves to pick up the high revenue trips. So they really don't pay much attention to deadhead miles. So, there, so there's been significant increase in what's called deadhead miles. In fact, in New York City, 20% of the trips have what's called deadhead miles, and New York City is 50%. So again, more data suggests that these, 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 these um, uh, <coughs> platforms increased congestion, but it's not all bad. So basically, there's been some estimate of the total number of vehicle miles added based on this. It's not all bad. The, the, the good things that these things do is that they do reduce car ownership, and they do reduce the driving time trying to find parking. There have been studies by a UCLA professor, which I think are somewhat inflated if you look at it, if you don't really dissect it. But basically, there's this notion that people looking for parking takes about 25% of the trip. I don't think that's true for people who are commuting uh, because it, usually you don't drive to work unless you know you have a parking spot or you're not going to drive. Most of us don't drive to work and, and drive around looking uh, for a spot, especially for those here at your ISI, right? Um, yes? But at the same time, you're probably not going to use an Uber for a that's, They're not. They're not. But they were, they were suggesting that you could do that, okay? They're not. So that's true. But um, so that's the argument they, they would make is that you, people don't have to look around for parking if they're going for us. So they're basically going to say the people who, who aren't driving around looking for parking um, are going to, that benefit is going to over, overcompensate for the extra deadhead miles. That's the argument they will make. So what we, what we, so this is kind of the historic, this is the data we're, we're, we're sending out there, okay? So what we, what we did as a, as a research group is we, we built, I don't know if you're familiar with these traffic assignment problems. There's these, basically these uh, large-scale optimization problems. I don't, don't really want to get into them because you can always look at the papers. That we basically embellished the kind of the standard traffic assignment problems to include these type of transportation systems in it. So we can measure. So what, we, what these traffic assignment problems is figure out what mode people are going to take if that's the cost structure of the system. Okay? And so what, 
what the x axis says, okay, we looked at kind of a um, uh, randomized kind of a transportation pattern, and what we varied was the symmetry, meaning the symmetry of the network. The the more so the if the symmetry is one, that means basically there's as much demand at the destination. So if there's as many people who want to go from A to B as B to A. So that if I drop somebody off at B, I could pick somebody off at B to go to A. So that's perfect symmetry. So, you, so in a perfect symmetrical network, you, you would expect that the dead head miles would be very low, right? Because you could just drop it and pick. In a perfectly symmetric, in an asymmetry model, it means basically that everybody's at A and everybody wants to go to B. And then, then you gotta go back to A to pick up the other person. So these are the different kind of randomized networks we looked at. That, and so that's, we have a different line on, for each of these different networks. On the x-axis, what we have is the percent of people who use this to commute versus driving alone. So it's the percentage of people who use this over the amount. And then the right hand, then the y-axis is then the increase, extra increase in uh, vehicle miles of this over the solution where everybody drives alone. So, so the, the, these are percentage increase over everybody driving alone, okay? So as you would expect, in a perfectly asymmetrical network, it's a basically almost a linear curve as more people adapt that because the, you basically have to go back and pick up somebody. You have to go back and pick up as you increase the number of users. In a perfectly symmetry world, which is the yellow line, you expect the deadhead miles to be close to zero is what you expect. But the world is somewhere in between, right? The world is somewhere in between. And yeah. So it never goes, it never improves over driving by yourself in this model, which kind of defeats the purpose of the whole world, right? Well, they're not all driving by themselves, they're still picking up people, right? It's just to drive by themselves. But they're compared against driving your car yourself. That, okay, so we're looking at a system where 100% of people are driving by themselves. That's the denominator, that's the denominator of this y axis. The, the numerator is, is the solution. If there's Uber in that system, yeah, so it never improves over everybody driving by themselves, according to this. Yes, and you would expect that. Then. So, as you take, take into like a carpool, like an Uber pool type of thing, which more than one people can. This does not have, we have another model which has the Uber, Uber pool, but so we don't have Uber pool in this model, but we could certainly add it. The reason we didn't add it is we don't want to add the complication. Uber pool right now is like maybe, yeah, it's a very small percentage, it's just noise. Perhaps that tells me that these things don't improve over driving yourself in any situation. No, absolutely. Uh, same, right. Right. Uh, but, 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 uh, uh, right. Right. And you would expect that, right? Because these systems would only add deadhead miles, right? Yeah. Right? So, that, so you would, uh, there would have to be something else that gives it, that you have to model that shows their benefit, right? which we don't have in there. Yeah. So, I mean, do you have a model that also considers that if I'm in an Uber, <clears> I can actually work? while I'm, you know, commuting so that that transportation cost right. is so so, not right, right. really there. No. Right. Okay, so that's, okay, so we're measuring congestion here. So, not, so what you bring up is a very good point. That's, that's in the model that decides whether I want to take Uber or not. Right, so whether you could do work or not is in the cost function of whether I decide to choose to select alone or whether I choose to use Uber. So that's the benefit to you, which is what we have. That, that's what dictates the percentage that who choose to use Uber or not, right? So who chooses to use Uber is, and we have modeled that, you know, right? Some people are gonna have a different preference, right? Different utility, right? That's what you're back to what you're talk about. But at the end of the day, whether you're getting a benefit or not, your impact on congestion is gonna be the same. Yeah, but the, tra the cost of uh, you know, transportation congestion goes down because I'm being productive. Well, I'm right. Right. So I'm not putting this in terms of cost. I'm just putting it in terms of DMT. Right. So right. That's a very good point. So if I was going to measure societal cost, it would be a different curve. I'm just I'm just measuring it based on just DMTs. That's exactly why we did we did we didn't do that kind of measure because it would be different. You're absolutely right. So that's um, some data that we have, and, and and it's a very hot research topic right now. Transportation, trying to figure out these kind of things, right? Because everybody's interested about Uber. Because almost, like I'm sure, almost everybody here has used Uber once in their lifetime. Pretty reasonable to assume, right? 
So, I mean, this is something that people are very interested in and, and people are really trying. So there's empirical data now. So, I mean, basically, to make a long story short, there's empirical data saying that, and of course, the other part that we have a model that people now see, and you see it at LAX, is they add to congestion because of double parking, right, which we don't add to the model. Right, so that's that's another thing that you know. So this only adds the dead. This this model only considers the deadhead miles, but there are other factors that, that that one needs to consider if you're looking at it from a. And, and you know, these models are not simple; they're very complicated. And so you know, you, you almost got to just keep in, in adding these in a piecewheel fashion until you finally get a very. You know, but I think we we've got a good start on this. So, so let's say if I wanted to do uh, ride sharing, there's really many different. Uh, challenges associated and, and basically from a research point of view. And I'm only going to talk about only one of them, the mechanism design, how we share the cost. But if I was, I mean, so we've done work in, let's say, three of the five. The first two, I think, are pretty much solved today because of the basic computational issues. Trying to do high matching is pretty, I mean, you should be able to do with today's technology, matching passengers to group of passengers together and uh, through the driver should be done doable. That should not be a, a difficult problem. And the trust and reputation system, is, I think now um, most people are familiar to using, uh, most people are very comfortable. I mean, most people are comfortable with getting in the car with an Uber driver and the reputation of that and the payment scheme, you know, that they're set up for this, these were really, Big issues for them at first, but I think people now, especially the younger generation, I don't know, but I'm guess speculating they're not as freaked out about this as they used to be. Um, so I, I think the only thing I would say is there have been studies that basically for for the, the trust part about Uber, you know, if you look at most rating systems, Ubers tend to and Lyft tend to be inflated more so than others. Okay, and can you think of a reason why? Yeah. When they ask me to rate a driver, if I rate four, they ask me what went wrong. Right. Right. Four is bad for them, so. Right. So, and plus they know you, right? They've got, they've made the connection, right? So they, so the, let's say you put your evaluation within the next. Um, they know you. If you're going to evaluate, how soon are you going to evaluate it? Usually within the next couple hours, right? Otherwise, you're not going to remember to do it. So they'll know their ratings as they change within the last, let's say, 24 hours. And it's not going to be very difficult for them to know who, you know that they're going to know who it was, right? The nimity there is not like it is for the restaurant, right? The nimity at a restaurant is much more so than it is for, um, uh, for Uber and Lyft. And that's why people are, I'm, I'm, I'm less inclined, I think. I'm only speculating. I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> it's only speculation. But they, they, their, their trust and reputation systems are, are not. I'll just briefly mention routing. Routing is actually very interesting. I mean, so the reason I'm interested in, uh, I mean, my bread and butter over time has been routing. Basically, how do you figure out how to get from A to B, and, how, and especially if you have multiple people, how do you, do, how do you pick up, basically, the standard TSP, traveling salesman problem. Um, the, the new wrinkle that um, ride sharing brings to the routing literature is that each, so in, the, in basically typical, let's think about any kind of traveling salesman, any node, any extra node you add to the network, is going to typically increase the cost. But in ride sharing, that may not necessarily be true. Because if you pick up an extra person, you may be able to qualify for a carpool lane, so it may reduce your time. You may be able to qualify for a toll road reduction, which means you can um, reduce your cost. So the interesting wrinkle in ride sharing uh, routing is that each additional demand point may actually reduce the cost. Whereas in almost sectors, each additional one is going to always strictly, it's a non-decreasing function in terms of the demand. Here it's not. So let's talk about, um, I've already talked about, about this, I don't reason to talk about this. Okay, so what we want to do is, is, is basically, if let's say, big all, Satish, you are the two potential customers I want to pick up, and how much should you guys pay for that trip, okay? And so what we want is we want to, be able to, there's kind of some guiding principles. We want to basically have the system pay. So this is a cost sharing system. This is not Uber, right? So we, this is not an Uber system. This is a system where some of the other companies that want, and this is what we call the transportation marketplace. What we want is basically a system that pays for itself. That's not subsidized. Okay. We want 
basically, once I quote the price, there's no incentive to drop out. And just as important is I want people to make requests as early as possible. I want to give that kind of incentive. Why? Because we know in, in routing theory, it's always cheaper the less dynamic the system is. Because I can always come up with a better route if I, get, if I know the information, right? So the information is of value. The earlier I have the demand requests, the cheaper, the better routes I can create and the cheaper routes I can be, right? So the, these are incentives. So I want to do this all relatively fast and, and, and give quotes as they come in, okay? So let me get started off with a very simple example. I think it's probably best illustrates it by example. Let's say I'm in the middle, and I want to go to, and I'm, and I'm a driver, and I suppose a passenger wants to go from where I'm at to the endpoint, that's passenger one, and passenger two wants to go from the middle to the other endpoint, and suppose passenger three wants to go from the very end to the beginning, okay? So we got this one, two, three, okay? And I'm a driver in the, the middle there, okay? And let's say they call, so the idea is that you give them a quote as soon as they, they use their app. And they press it. as soon as they press their ad, you give them a quote. And the question is, what should that quote be? Okay, so let's, let's think about, and we're going to assume we're always going to do optimal routing. Okay, we can always compute the optimal route. For a small number of people, we can certainly always compute the optimal route. So let's say the first person calls up. The direct distance is two. And let's say the cost is $10 per mile. It's very simple, simple area. The total cost of that trip is 20, and the marginal cost from going pick up this person is 20, let's say. And let's say the we don't know what the shared cost is. So that's what we would quote the first person, okay? Let's say that's what we'd quote if he was the only customer. Now let's say customer two calls, okay? The optimal route would be pick up one and then pick up two. And the total distance is going to be uh, six, and so the total cost is 60. The marginal cost is it's going to be 40, okay? And suppose if we're going to charge that person a marginal cost, we'll charge them 40, right? The second person, right? The first person, we still keep them at 20. The second person, we charge them at 40. Now we see where this kind of thinking breaks down. Now we can see where this type of thinking breaks down. If the third person calls up and wants to go from to, I mean, from where they're at to the end, I would pick up the first one, drop off the first one, pick up the, uh, the third customer, go pick up the second one, and go to the end, right? The total cost stays the same, and the marginal cost for the third person is zero. Obviously, we see something that's unfair here, right? The person who's requesting the, 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 the most, the longest distance is going to be charged nothing. So obviously, using kind of a, sh a marginal cost framework is not going to be fair by any definition, okay? So let's go through three different kind of um, costing schemes that people would use for transportation. A fixed, like a shuttle system is mostly a fixed fare, right? So let's say we would charge a fixed fare of $10. Well, then you charge $10 to everybody. And that's, what, that's one way you could do it. You could do it based on incremental, which is basically just a marginal cost. And that would be 10, 20, 40, and 0. Or you could do it proportional to how much they would cost if they, so we know our total cost is 60, so they each could pay in proportion to what their direct distance is. So, so that means if, since the second, the third person requires twice the direct distance than others, they would pay twice as much as the others, and they would pay in those proportions. And this, so you get 15, 15, and 30. So let's say those were our different um, ways of, of, uh, of, of, of charging this, and then talk about whether they're good ways or not. So in, so in mechanism design, there's kind of some, um, let's say, properties you want to hold. One is budget balance, which means that basically the entire, that what everybody pays is equivalent to the total cost. Okay. Immediate response basically says the passenger calls up, you give them that quote immediately, and that that price is never going to go up. That price is never going to go up. It may go down, but it never will go up. Okay. 
Fairness means if I'm using more of the resource, I should, I should pay more, basically. I'm just putting it in context of, of this. And everybody is truthful about their time, right? They're not, they're not gonna game the system, okay? So let's, 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 let's go back to, the, to our example and see where they fail. Clearly the fixed fare is gonna be impossible to do budget balance on a fixed fare scheme. It's gonna be very difficult since you don't know what the demand is. Um, the, the in incremental is not gonna be fair, right? Because you see there the third passenger is only paying zero whereas the other two are, are paying much, much less. Uh, the problem with the proportional is for me to figure out what the proportions is, I have to know everybody advance. I have to know who everybody is. Well, I gotta give the quote to first person before I know the second and the third person game, okay? So that's, that's gonna be very hard to do that. So, so they all fail some property that we want. So, but there's an obvious way of doing this that's actually solved it in a nice, clean way. So what we have is what is something called a proportional online mechanism, which is a, a, a basically a combination of both the immediate response and online fairness. And I don't wanna get into the, to the details. I think it's best to illustrate it. So it's basically a combination of both, I would say, marginal cost and so, or, or incremental, whatever you want to call it, and proportional. So what you do is you form correlations. Within correlations, they're going to be charging passengers proportionally. And then once you start a new correlation, you're going to implement a marginal cost framework. And so I think it's best to go back to the example and illustrate it. But that's the idea, is that you're going to form correlations, and within a correlation, you hope to charge, well, you do charge proportionally. And then once a customer is not added to that coalition, they're going to be charged for uh, the marginal. So let's, let's, do, let's go back to the example. Okay. So let's say the first person calls up. The, the total cost is going to be 20. They're, um, that's the only cost raised, and you're going to char charge on 20. Now, the first passenger it has a willingness to pay. If the willingness to pay is less than 20, they're gonna accept it and they're gonna be added to that vehicle, okay? Now the second person calls up and the first thing you're gonna do is you could see if I can add, so if I add the second person to trip, the total cost goes up to 60, right? The first thing you're gonna see is can I add them to the same coalition? If I can add the second person to the coalition of the first, that means I'm gonna charge this second person proportional. And that's going to be good. Okay. So that means then, since they both have the same distance, the second person is going to be quoted 30, and the first person will be quoted 30. But that gets rejected because the first person was already quoted 20. The first person was already quoted 20, so it's rejected because the price can't go up for the first person. So that means the second person gets forms a new coalition, and since it's a new coalition, they get charged the marginal. So they get the, so now the fair structure is the first person pays 20, and the second person pays 40. So that's what I mean by mix. So now the third person calls up. Okay. The third person calls up, the total cost goes 60. Okay. Now you're going to try to form the correlation with the, with the, with the third person with the second person. And the way this mechanism works, and, we, and you prove it, is that if the second person accepts it, then maybe the first person. So they're sequential. If the second person rejects it, then there's going to be no chance the first person rejects it. So the first thing we could do is check the correlation with all three together, okay? Because we know if that's rejected in the second one, so we could compare to all three. So if we do all three together, what happens? Well, we could check that the, yeah, if we do all three together, the cost becomes 60, and if we charge them in proportion, the, um, so it becomes then, 60, the first person gets paid 15, the second person now goes down, to, and the first person goes down to 15, and his was a 20, so he's happy, he goes from 20 to 15. And then uh, the second person is happy because they went from 40 to 15, and the third person now, the question with the third person is whether the quote of 30 is below their willingness to pay. Let's assume it is, now you form it, and now you have, now it ends up with them all in one correlation paying proportional, but not, you didn't get that way all the way. At, at some point, there were separate correlations, and then as, as throwing up more demand, you put them back into a single correlation. 
So that's the way basically Pox works. But it, so this is basically our first pass at this. And you can see right away there's some problems with this pricing. What's one of the things it ignores? Is after the first person accepted and the second person accepted, they may have a value of time. Right? We're just basing this based on just the fact that there's just as long as their trip, as long as their cost goes down, they're happy, right? But they may not be happy because of some time commitment. So what we're doing now, and I have a new project, which is basically adding a time dimension to this. And that changes it and that, that complicates it significantly. <laughs> Even just that small wrinkle to it, it complicates it. Um, significantly. And, and uh, we have proofs for all these, but they all basically only hold if you assume we're routing optimally. Yeah? So how does Uber share work today? It doesn't do any of this, right? Right. So what the, I don't know. So it's very difficult to figure out what Uber share does, okay? Because I think it's basically a combination of fixed fare and they try to do some kind of estimation. I mean, I think they do basically Fixed fare. So sometimes you, you will get lucky, right? Because they quoted you a price thinking that there's someone else going to be in the trip, but no one else, no one else gets like added to it and you're getting it. And then sometimes you get screwed because you, they quoted you a price and they're stuffing two or three people in the car into it. So they're not, so they're, they're, they're doing some kind of, so they're, they're not, but it averages out okay. no, but, and then you're okay with it. Right. Right. And it's not clear that they're, um, they're certainly not doing any of this stuff, right, in terms of fairness and figuring this out, right? Because remember, they, they have a different model. They're trying to also increase, they're also looking at profitability, right? This is not looking at profitability. This is simply looking at, um, at, um, at um, basically recouping the cost. And actually, this gets a little bit more complicated because and it depends on how you want to view the driver. The question is the driver also needs to figure out if they want their whole trip. The problem with having a driver, and, the, and this is the parts that I'm working on and trying to figure out the, oops, the wrong way. The problem with having the, the passengers pay the full, there's a fundamental problem with having the passengers pay the full fare. And it's that the first, let's say you're doing the first passenger who's quoted a price is going to be most likely be quoted at a very high price that their willingness to pay is not. Right? It's only once you've added that second and third that they're priced, but that's no guarantee, right? So that first quote that you give the passenger, and if you're saying that passengers are paying the full fare and the driver is not sharing any of the cost, that first person is going to be probably giving them a quote that's pretty high. And so you have to figure out how you want to do that to get past it. Maybe the driver initially subsidizes it and he does not uh, quote the full fare to the passengers because he knows that the capacitor is not going to accept it. So it's, it's actually much more complicated than I'm, I'm, I'm alluding it to be. So, so this, these, these proofs only hold if you're doing optimal routing. The reason that's so is because you got to assume the cost structure is non-decreasing. Non, non and if you're using optimization, you know that each customer you're adding is going to create a non-decreasing non cost structure. This is assuming no carpool lanes or anything. But if you're using heuristics, it's not clear that heuristic solution that has more passenger is going to become more expensive than one that's not. Unless, of course, you always... So it's, it's kind of funky in terms of that, in terms of the heuristics. So the question is, and most writing algorithms use heuristics. So the question is, I'm talking about the truthfulness property. If, if, if you're using heuristics, can people game it? Meaning, because why would people gaming it? Especially, you know, if, if, if you know that your price is going to be lower as you, the later you call. That's what I'm concerned about, people calling later because they think their price is going to be lower because you have a chance of, you know, being late. So can you game it? Okay? Because your quote is going to be based on the sequence, especially if you can think of this uh, that you, you get. So the question is, can you hope to get a better quote if you game it? And so we ran a bunch of simulations, and what the x-axis shows is the submission time when you, when you made that request out of 100 people. The one of you shows you the, the cost per mile that you're being charged. Um, uh, that's the one on the one, and you can show the 75 and the 25 percentile, and you'll show the curve as it goes up, okay? And the other one shows the probability of being matched. As, as you can see, 
as a sub it's not strictly decreasing function, but you can see that in general that gaming it by delaying your time, your probability of being matched does get lower and your cost structure does increase. So even if you're using heuristics, on average, you're going to probably be worse off if you, get, if you try to game it. But there may be some instances that you can. If you're using optimal routing, you, you can't game it. The optimal strategy is to be truthful. Okay. So what I want to talk about is the next cost sharing example. And this one is actually different. So I do both. Yeah. So on the previous one, I mean, one wrinkle is if I'm a passenger that uses this service to mm -hmm. go to work every day, mm -hmm. I will accumulate a history where I know that, you know, sometimes I get lucky mm -hmm. and it was cheaper. Mm -hmm. So I know when it's expensive. Right. Uh, so, so if I'm doing optimal routing, is your advantage to go early and tell me when you really need it. It's when only when I'm using history heuristic routing that I can't prove that's the game case. But, but if you offer me 40 and I know that, you know, many times I get 15, then I'll say, no, I, that's too high for me. And I, uh, because I know that many days I got it for 15. Uh, or instead of 20, so I know that somehow I'm not being okay. treated well because okay. you know, many times I do get it cheaper. Right. Okay. okay, so that's the, so you're asking very good questions. Um, so if I'm doing optimal routing, this is the thing I could definitely prove to you. The days that you got different price is because the, who you got matched with was different. It's not because you, you delayed. It's because your, your, your matchings were, were, were different, okay? But on that day, if you had called later to try to game it, your cost would have gone up. Let's say for that demand on that day, if your cost went up, it's, if the costs were high, it's not because you delayed your call, if I'm doing optimal routing. That, delaying your call will only benefit you when I'm doing heuristic routing. So you may have experienced different costs each day. And the reason you may experience different costs each day if I'm doing optimal routing is not because you delayed your cost. It's because the, the, who you got matched with, whose other travelers on that day are different. And, and you, may, as a consumer, may not know that, right? And so that's where, you know, that's, but that's assuming I did optimal routing. Now, if I didn't do optimal routing, then you're right. You, there might be a chance that you could do that. In, in which case you would cancel and then re, re request. That's right. Because That's right. they get matched with a more beneficial uh, companion. Ah, okay. Now you're you're talking. Okay, now you're talking. I didn't give you the big assumption that I gave here, which is what I'm fixing. The big assumption I didn't give here is that this system starts. We're all so that I'm quoting the prices the calls are coming in. But the vehicle, the vehicle, I'm assuming that all the vehicles depart after all the demand zone. So let's say you're calling in and you're getting quotes in real time, but the vehicle is departing after it. So, so the point is that having that extra demand is not going to change the routing, because I'm assuming I'm doing optimal routing. So you're going to always be given the cheapest possible quote with the demand pattern the earlier you call. Yeah, no, but if I call and I feel it's too expensive compared to my previous call, right. I, I, I cancel and maybe some other sucker will call in and accept my expensive spot, then I call a second later and I get paired with him and I get it cheaper. Well, what I'm showing, but what I'm saying is, I, I, no, I know what you're saying. But what I'm saying is that's not going to happen if I'm doing optimal routing. The system will, 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 will find the matching where your cost is going to be higher because of the way the mechanism works. Yeah. Following up thing on the same thing. Yeah. It makes make more sense. Like, I want to depart between this time and this time and figure out the optimal route within that in the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Right. And then you don't have to give me the, the price right now. You give it in 10 minutes and maybe those 10 minutes you can figure out the optimal routes. Right. I mean, actually, Uber, Uber Pool or Lyft, I mean, they do that. They give you, they give you two minutes. They, they, they spend two minutes trying to figure out the, the your route when you do a pool, a right, a right. With more people. But so, but it could be ten minutes, and then hopefully there's enough demand, and you can really do enough routing that you can actually optimize. 
and give a, a good, fair right. first time, because otherwise, right, you stand and right, stand. right, that's all. I'm not paying for the last time, just waiting 10 more minutes and call it. Well, okay, so, so wouldn't the cost be, cost be reduced if or later people call in and want to take the same route? Or is the first price that you give him the price he's going to pay? I thought it could get reduced. It gets reduced. It gets reduced. And that's why, that's why I'm saying is if you're doing optimal routing, I'll address your question, but, but if you're doing optimal routing and all the passengers are known before the vehicle departs and new demand comes in that benefits you, you're going to make use of that benefit in, if you called in early, right? If you called in later, you're not... That so you, you, or you, well, or you might be able to make that matching because, right, you may have that thing may be exceeded their, its capacity or something, right? So you risk that, right? So, but that's all assuming you're doing optimizing routing. Um, so, the key things, and that's why I can stand here and show you that I don't want to go into, into the details of it, but what I do know is true is that if all the demand is known before all the vehicles leave and I'm doing optimized routing, I can guarantee you there's no benefit in, in delaying. Now, if I violate one of those two assumptions, then certainly what you both are saying is correct. Because then you're right. Then someone comes, some new, some new information gets into the system that I didn't know about that causes me to then say, okay, I wish I'd called later because I could get that benefit of this new information that I didn't have. I think what we're saying is like most people at all consumers would be happy with a 10 minute minute of, I don't know what. Five or ten minutes, you can actually gather more information and use more accurate, accurate pricing. And the other thing that this thing, like, I don't have a chance of getting a lower price, it sounds good, but it's uncertain. I don't know how people would so you react to it. Right? I can put it like on 20 dollars. Right. Half the time, like, oh, right. it's cheap, so I'm not happy, but like, I never know. Well, right. So then half the time, I don't get it. It sort of sounds a little like eBay where you can yeah. go. Right. You like, can you can say, option, if you, like, if right. you pay 100 bucks now, you'll just get it, or you can start the bidding, right? And right. You may end up paying more, you may right. end up paying less. Well, okay, but, but, the, <laughs> but the same thing can work, right? The same thing yeah. system can work. Instead of saying, I'm going to give you a quote immediately, I'll just give you a quote within 10 minutes, right? You can certainly do that. And the same things, all the same things are going to hold, right? Instead of giving an immediate quote, but you just delay everything in 10 minutes. But you should be able to have better estimates. Yes, 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 yes. But, but, that, but that's not going to change anything because you're still assuming that all the demand is known before the vehicle departs. So whether you wait 10 minutes or, to, or, or it's, so that's the key assumption. That's why what, what you're saying is, is kind of goes away once you make that assumption. And that's why um, I said this is a very rich kind of research area because you can see how when you start with the basic assumptions, then try to add realism, how things get complicated very quickly. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious when you will fix these assumptions mechanism design. Um, like I imagine there are interaction effects with the other factors that you described, like the five right. uh, congestion right. and things. Like uh, do you anticipate sort uh, anticipate uh, like knock on effects in a way of on like congestion when you do like in the process of doing doing this design? I mean I guess when you were saying mm -hmm. you're accounting for time and things like that is a minor wrinkle but it adds a lot of to things um, in the process of like designing the, uh, doing the design. Uh, well, I, sorry, I, lost, I just lost my own train of thought. Uh, do, do you have thoughts basically on um, the interactions between uh, the mechanism design and the other factors? Yeah, that's a very good thing. And that's a very good, I mean, you ask, because how you develop the routes may depend on heavily on how you should cost how you determine how people pay. Mm -hmm. And how people pay depends very much on the cost. So it's one of these chicken and the egg questions. And, and these interactions are very complicated. And so, as I said, this is kind of a first. So what we're starting off is that we're assuming we're doing everything optimally from a routing point of view. Assuming we're behaving optimally, from, which is not realistic because the world is not optimal, right? So the question is, that's why so this is kind of a base kind of start. Once you start thinking of how we want to do kind of routing in the real world, with taking into account all these congestion effects, then the cost sharing problem gets much more complicated because then there's the interacting effects, right? Because how I want to do routing may depend on how I'm going to cost charge people. 
and how I charge. I mean, and the routing is going to impact maybe how I want to charge people. So the question is how you model that interaction effects is you're very complicated and a very interesting. So we kind of a somewhat kind of as a first basis said, okay, well, let's assume we're doing writing optimally, assuming that we can behave in this optimal realm. How would I even even do cost sharing? And that was basically the, the point of the, of, the, of the exercise. And I think, and so now it becomes then, and, and so let me just say, and we haven't done this because, you know, we have PhD students who want to come, but if I was to say, really wanting to do this and commercialize this, maybe I wouldn't be so concerned about these theoretical guarantees, right? And maybe I wouldn't be so concerned about trying to prove these theoretical guarantees, and I'd be okay with, with, with some kind of a mechanism that kind of, on average, does do this and it doesn't be, and, and somehow makes it very difficult to game, right? And, and, but we didn't start off with that point of view. Right, so I mean, so I, I would certainly say that if I was trying to commercialize this, I would set to certainly come at it at the angle that you you can can come, you would come at it and, and and try to come up with heuristics to measure these uh, interactions. Okay, so so another project that I, I I I I don't know how much time I don't want to I don't know how much time I have here I don't know how long your seminars is five minutes oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, I, and I always hate some of our speakers who speak forever, and you're like, oh, I hope I got out of here, you know, this guy won't stop talking. So I'll be very quick here and kind of show you why I think this whole, this is a rich history of, of, um, of cost sharing trends. You know, I'm, I, I'm an editorial board of numerous different uh, transportation journals, and I, I think we know how to do routing optimally. I think trying to, to to try to write another NSF proposal on how to do writing is not going to get funding. I think the rich history now is how to make use of the existing capacity, how to make capacity. This is really a freight example that really brought me to it. So the California flower industry here in California has lost market share from 75% to 25% in about a 20-year time frame. And basically, you have three main areas that send flowers. One is, if you know, if you've been to Santa Barbara, you see those flower... Um, if you go down to Carlsbad in San Diego, north of there, there's flowers. And there's uh, Salinas, Salinas in south of San Francisco. You have basically these three different main areas of flowers. And you have independent California growers. They lost market share to basically South America. In particular, I mean, I can tell the story much better, but it's only in three, four minutes. I got to go really straight to the point. They basically lost market share three to, to South America, Colombia in particular. And... And they hired us to say, basically, to look into the problem. And they said, well, our cost structure is high. And I said, oh, yeah. Anybody who tells you says, yeah, sure, it's going to be cheaper having flowers in, from Colombia than it is because labor is cheaper there, right? That's the, that's the natural human reaction. They said, well, if you look at, and then this is kind of an exa exaggeration, if you look at the cost of a flower, make a flower, the growing cost, the cutting cost is maybe 5 to 10%. The logistics and transportation are much higher. Then that's when I got interested. Are you, are you telling me then that it costs more to ship flowers from Colombia to Chicago than from California? I was like, floors you, right? I mean, that's the first thing, you know, you got to be kidding me. Then I get excited, right? Then I'm getting excited, right? Because this is something I could, I, could, I could get my hand. Now, there's some other things that make the cost cheaper. I don't know if you, this is happening during a time of the drug wars and the federal government was definitely have incentivized the, the Colombians to, instead of growing poppy, to grow something else. So they may have been given some incentives from the federal government to, to uh, grow flowers than, 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 than the poppy. I'm just speculating there, okay? But let's just stay on the transportation. What we do know is the transportation costs are definitely cheaper. So this is how they do it. Remember the first thing I said in my, in my presentation in transportation? Volume is king if in terms of passengers or goods. So here's what uh, each of the growers in Southern California, uh, ships their demand separately to uh, the, the destination. The, the, the growers from Columbia send it by air to this huge facility in Miami, and they send it by full truckload. So the difference between a full truckload versus a less truckload on a per unit basis can be more than 
three to four times cheaper on a per unit basis. So if I only pay for a third of the truck, that so I'm paying on a per unit basis much higher for 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 a third of the truck than if I would say I'm gonna pay for the full truck, right? So it's gonna be significantly cheaper on a pay per unit basis. So that's the benefit they get. So then the natural question becomes then is then why don't the California growers build a consolidation facility? They send it to the consolidation city, then they get a full truckload and then send it out, right? That means that's the natural thing. So we were asked in this kind of very applied project to evaluate that and determine the cost savings, okay? So I don't want to get into it, but the, basically the bottom line is if you do that, obviously you're going to get much cheaper and everybody wins out from a system point of view. From a system point of view, that's going to win. And this is where it led me to my NSF project is that after, after we showed that if you build a consolidation system, from a system point of view, you're going to reduce and benefit. You know, this is a big PR center. We gave a talk, and, this, and the congressman was there because they, they, this industry is really suffering, and they want some federal help, and they want some help. But in that talk, as I walked out in the presentation in the media, the, one of the large growers in – so the idea was to build a consolidation center in Oxnard, which would be a good middle ground. As I walked out of the, the media presentation, the, one of the larger growers from uh, Salinas came to me and says, you know, Professor, I respect what you're saying. I don't like anything you're doing. In fact, you're going to cost me money. And I, he's right. And that large grower was right. And why is that? He's in Salinas. He's already got enough demand probably to send it by full truckload. Right? Why would he want to send it to Salinas? I mean, sorry, to, to um, Oxnard just to add extra trip time to benefit his competition. Right? So he's got no incentive to participate in this facility. And if the big growers aren't involved, guess what? The benefits of the consolidation goes away. So then it starts becoming then, here's another example where cost sharing becomes it, right? How do you incentivize the big growers to participate in this cost sharing scheme so that way you get a benefit out of it? Shared, right? So, so, that, so, so, so the small growers shouldn't get all the benefit, right? They have to so you know what the total system cost is from benefit. Now you guys share that extra cost, right? And so the question is, what should you do? And how should you pay them, right, to convince them to come in there? And that's where we got our NSF proposal, and we have some approaches to doing it, and, and I'll stop there. But basically, that was kind of another example where, you know, you could think of like, and the most natural intuitive mechanisms don't work here. But if you make some, again, some minor tricks to it, you can get some mechanisms that can incentivize the large growers to participate. And I'll, I'll leave it here. Yeah. So I'm from Colombia. And okay. So, I mean, a lot of those flower growers mm -hmm. are in very close to Bogota, which means they're very close to the airport. There you go. Yep. Uh, and they are actually on very expensive land, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not, you know, drugs are grown in remote areas. Not in these areas. So that's not yeah. one of the reasons. No, the reason is it, they make a lot of money. It's very profitable. Yeah, but they, but they make a lot of money because if they've reduced the transportation costs. Yes. I mean, they, they have reduced the, They have definitely reduced it. Right. Well, so flying such a long distance is so much cheaper, apparently. No, it's not the flying. It's the, the truckloads in the United States. Well, the, their the benefit best. is the truckload. They're, they're, they're going. The benefit is just the truck. I mean, it's a huge distance, right? So presumably, Flying has to be cheaper than driving a truck all that way, which I suppose you could do. Uh, then wh why do the uh, American, why the California growers not fly their uh, flowers to Chicago? But the problem is that they would be flying on a, they won't be consolidating. The benefit is the consolidation. So they. But why? I mean, then it wouldn't be. They're consolidating with all the other people who are shipping things by plane. I mean, they're not going to use just, you know. No, but then, no, 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 no. But the, 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 the shipping companies charge you not based on the fact that other people are getting in there. They're gonna, this is how they make their money, is right? Because you're only using, it's the same thing as a truck, right? The, the, the truck company that's using less than truck loads, they're not, let's say it's going by truck and you're only filling a third. It's not like they're not filling up the other two thirds with other people's demand. They are filling up the other people's, that they're, they're doing the consolidation themselves, but they're charging you the non-consolidated price. Airplanes do that as well. Airplanes do that, everybody does that. And in fact, the, People that were, the agency that was fighting hard, that, I mean, the association that was fighting very hard against this uh, consolidation center was the trucking companies. 
Uh, in my presentation, the, the target person says, this is a bad idea, right? Because they're getting, they're, they're still getting their trucks at, two, at full capacity, but they're charging you based on the less the truck load rate. So, so then the growers who were then using, using the federal government um, as an excuse for giving the Colombians subsidies for these fields are not telling me the full picture then, is what you're saying. I think so, yeah. When you fly into Bogota, you see all the that flowers. <laughs> and this is not where they're going to be growing the poppy seed, right? No. And the white right. plastic. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. So, but no, but then it, it does suggest, though, still, it's still, I mean, it still suggests, I mean, this is the, what they told me, is it's cheaper. And that's the thing I couldn't get a handle with, is how can it be cheaper to send flowers from Bogota? Let's say they're right there on the airplanes, yeah. right? Right there still, right? Right next to the airport. Let's say they're on the air. How can it still be cheaper to get from there to Chicago than, as, as Zagal would say, from, 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 from L.A. to Chicago? I mean, it just makes no sense. But yet, it's because of that trucking rates. So they, their airfare, they must be packing that whole plane. And, and they, may, they may even own the planes, right? right? They may even own those planes. And so it goes to show you that, that the cost structure here in the United States in terms of shipping is probably much higher than the other ones. Yeah. And it's a three-hour flight to Miami. Yeah, it's not that, another thing. It's not that long, right? Right. Right. Uh, can you see an analogy with uh, the, the point that you made that it's hard to get the big players involved in this consolidation, again, in the passenger market? I mean, so passenger ride sharing. Right. I mean, right. It, it's the whole the whole thing is that people and goods or anybody is, is there has to be an incentive to share, right? There's an inconvenience for sharing, right? There's an inconvenience to do consolidation. That's an extra that's an extra handling. There's an inconvenience for ride sharing, right? And the question is, is the economic incentive for that inconvenience gonna over compensate for the cost of the inconvenience. And I think at ride sharing, and why ride sharing hasn't really blown up right now is because um, the cost of a single trip is not really high enough. And I believe in your lifetime, maybe not in my lifetime, that cost is going to be high enough where, where, where people driving alone just is not going to make sense. In terms of this, the goods movement, there's a clear incentive, disincentive for a big grower to participate. Unless, as Egal says, you pay them. And the question is figuring out how to pay them. And that's where I see the commonality. Okay. Thank you. Welcome.